So there was a young man who lived in uh, the Dweep town who went by the name of Kamini Mohan. This name is very significant. Kamini means uh, a beautiful young girl, one who is very attractive to young men. And Mohan means bewilderment. So this name Kamini Mohan indicated uh, that this young man he liked to see young girls, and when he would see them, he would become bewildered. <laughs> this is an illustrative story. You don't have to take it as literal fact. But I'm just explaining the elements so that they, the point being illustrated comes out very clear. So Kamini Mohan had a friend who uh, was very much inclined to Krishna consciousness. And this friend was always thinking of the spiritual welfare of Kamini Mohan. So one day his friend came to him, told Kamini Mohan, that at Mayapur there is one great saintly Vaishnava who is visiting the Yoga Peet. The Yoga Peet is the temple which marks the exact place of appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 500 years ago. It's a great white structure with a, a sort of needle a tower going up in the Bengali temple style. So at the Yoga Peak Mat, Yoga Peak Temple, this saintly Vaishnav spiritual master will be giving lectures. And it is our great fortune that he has come to this facility. So my dear friend Kamini Mohan, we should waste no time, we should go there and attend his lectures. In this way, benefit our spiritual life. Kamini Mohan, because he was very interested in sense gratification, he was most reluctant to hear about spiritual life. So he said to his friend, What? You're proposing that I go all the way to Mayapur? That's so far. You know, I, I never travel such great distances. His friend said, great distance, what are you talking about? It's only good two kilometers away. No, no, two kilometers from me, that's very long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then his friend thought, hmm, I'm going to have to trick him. So a little later in the conversation, then his friend brought up a different idea. He said, by the way, me one, a one traveling uh, not circus, what do you call these? Traveling amusement parks with a Ferris wheel, merry go round, like that. We also have these in India. So, one traveling amusement park has set up at Kulia. Now, Kulia is a city that is about two kilometers west of um, Navadri. It's also up the bank of the Ganges, but it's on the Navadip side of my In other words, it's uh, just across the river from my So uh, this friend said to Kuli, uh, I'm sorry, to Kamini Mohan that uh, there's this amusement park, so why don't we go there? And Kamini Mohan was immediately enthusiastic. Oh, yes. Very good, let's go. Because he was thinking, at these places, many young girls go. I'll be able to see so many nice young girls today. So then he went with his friend. And they wandered around the music park for some time. Kamini Mohan got his eye full. And then his friend said, he gestured across the river, because they were standing near the river, and they could see the Yoga Peak Tower. Look, Kamini Mohan! There's Yoga Peak so close. And that saintly person is now lecturing. If we simply cross this river, see the boat is there? One paisa takes us across, and we're there. So let's go. Kamini Mohan. He said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You want me to cross this river? <laughs> you don't know about me. I never cross rivers. And these rivers, you know, they're very frightening to me. If I just get near one, my heart starts to beat so hard, I get dizzy, 
I'm so fearful of falling in the water and being swept away. No, no, I, I, I can't cross this river. I'm sorry. And his friend said, his friend was very disappointed. I mean, you all could see that. And he, he was thinking, oh, I shouldn't disappoint my friend so badly as this. So then, to kind of cheer up his friend, he said, listen, my dear friend, don't be so disheartened by me. Uh, I tell you what, you propose that we cross the river during the dry season. Because the monsoon had just come, so the river was quite full. So in India, generally everywhere, there's rain only one period of the year. This is the four-month period called Chaturmas. Monsoon clouds come and there's torrential rain in different areas of India during these four months. And then after that period passes, it's generally dry. And so during the dry season, the less important rivers, which became very, very big during monsoon, they gradually shrivel up. Sometimes they disappear altogether or they become a little peak, a little speed. So Kamini Mohan said to his friend, listen, let's wait till the dry season. Then we can just wade across the river, you know, just run across, no problem. His friend shook his head and said, Come in, Mohan, stop playing games. And this is the Ganges River. The river Ganges <laughs> never goes dry. It never becomes so shallow that you can run across. And you know this as well as I do. You live in Navadri. You've lived here your whole life. You know what the Ganges is like. Why do you talk this way? You're simply being dishonest. You don't want to go to Mayapur. You don't want to hear about Krishna. Isn't it? Just admit the fact. Stop playing all these games in this world. Now, the point of this story is illustrating. It's very relevant to this verse. Uh, that uh, Krishna is saying that whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his body, or Sanaskuti, that state he will attain without fail. So in other words, this, is, this verse is calling to humanity to prepare for death. Now, very often, the reaction of the human being to the idea of taking up spiritual life seriously is that this is an affair for old people. I'm young. And my senses are very strong, and I look in the mirror, I see I'm very good looking. This is the time of life for fun. So I'm going to enjoy myself now. And then later on, <laughs> during the dry season, <laughs> I will cross over to the spiritual side. But now let me stay on this side and amuse myself, get my Eiffel. <coughs> now, I think it's just like the Ganges never becomes dry. So similarly, uh, we never, in a sense, we can put it this way, we never become old. Because we're always old. Because what does old mean? Old mean, uh, old means near death. This is how we understand it. So who is not old? If one is 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old, you may think that that's young. But does that mean that you're not near death? We're always near death. We're always one step, one heartbeat away from death. Nobody can say when death will come. So if on this excuse that, oh, I'm young, let me wait till I'm old, now I'll enjoy it. If on this excuse, we are suddenly pulled out of this body by unforeseen death, then whatever state we have absorbed ourselves in this foolish period of our youth, that state we will force, be forced to attain in our next life. <laughs> and then the, youth, the foolishness of youth is no excuse, like Shiva Prabhupada said, that if a child young child, baby, who doesn't know any better, puts his hand in the fire 
the fire doesn't say, oh, this is a young child. I'll be kind to this young child. I won't burn it. No. The child's hand is burned just as well as anybody else's hand if it's placed in the fire. So like that also, the law of karma does not give any uh, credit for someone being young and foolish. No. If we quit our body in these youthful years, then we will attain whatever state of consciousness we will cultivate. So therefore, the conclusion is, is that everyone is near death, everyone is old, and everyone should be serious about cultivating Krishna consciousness right now. The problem is, is that we're living in an extremely materialistic culture. The whole conception of advancement, progress, in today's culture is in terms of technology, what is this technology? It is simply uh, an arrangement for gratifying the senses. That's what this technology means. Simply making the sense gratification more and more available to us at the touch of a button, you see. Before grandfather, great grandfather, our ancestors, they had to work so hard for the sense pleasures. Nowadays, People are laying in motorized beds which vibrate. <laughs> and there's an array of uh, buttons on the head of the bed and dials and switches and they just reach back and press something. Something happens, you see. A mechanical arm comes off one of the bed with a tray of nice goodies to eat. <laughs> or whatever. This is the purpose of the technology. And a uh, human being, unfortunately, this is not advancement, but being extremely stupid, extremely foolish, human being takes this as advancement uh, and becomes very, very puffed up. Very, very proud. This is, this is why it is not at all advancement. Anything that contributes to the false pride of the human being is actually degrading. So we become very proud in this modern day and age of our so-called success at material advancement, advancement of technology, and science, and medicine, and all these things. And we think that we become so expert and now we can cheat death. We think we've actually pushed the threat of death away from us. This is drilled into our heads even in the school. This is, I remember when I went to school, I would look in the history book, big, big history text, and always there would be these bleak pictures of the past, you see. Starting with the cavemen. <laughs> this is the way it used to be. You see some hairy people with a fresh killed animal that they're cutting up with stone dollars. <laughs> Huddling over a fire in winter. <laughs> so you turn the pages and you see these scenes from history. And everything was presented in such a way just to make you think how fortunate you are to have been born today. <laughs> Where everything is so easy, wonderful. In those days, they were suffering, they were dying when they were you know, 25 years old. If you were 25 years old then, you were a ripe old man or woman. But now, when you're 25, it means you're young and strong and beautiful. Do whatever you like. So, we think, foolishly, that by this so-called progress, we have pushed the threat of death away. And thus, we want to actually flaunt death, flaunt the laws of nature. Utilize this technology to prove to the universe that now, <laughs> no one can touch me. I'm 
free to do as I like. I recall reading not so long ago a newspaper report about one man in America who had a private airplane. And his idea of fun was to go up in the airplane with women, women that he would offer to take a ride in his airplane. And then he would have sex with them up in the plane while the plane was flying on autopilot. <laughs> so this way he was enjoying the flight. Now you may wonder why was this reported in the newspaper? Because the plane crashed into a mountain. <laughs> Newspaper reported from the position of the bombs <laughs> on the record. We understood that they were having sex at the time of the plane crash. <laughs> and you may take this as a rather grotesque <laughs> example, but I, I think it's a very good illustration of what's, what's wrong with our present culture. It's a very good sampling of today's mentality. We think some machine will help us enjoy to the max and free us from all limitations and free us from all dangers. And then the same wonderful machine plows into a mountain. There we are. <laughs> and as the Gita says here, that state of being that we were <laughs> meditating on at the time of death, we will surely attain in the next life. Imagine where that person is. <clears throat> so now that's one point. That everyone is old, everyone is near death, so everyone should wake up and become serious. Hmm. Another point is that, and that's brought up by Shiva Prabhupada in the purport, that one's thoughts during the course of one's life accumulate to influence one's thoughts at the moment of death. So this life creates one's next life. There are people who, as, as we said, these people who think that let me wait till I get old. They don't understand that even if they do, even if they are able to survive uh, so long, that when they get old and wrinkled and life of sense gratification is no longer not only no, no longer so much fun but not even really possible for them because you see you know how young people react if they're gathered in some discotheque there's you know the shaboom shaboom music playing and they're all dancing and then some you know 80 year old codger comes in with no team <laughs> dancing among the other people. <laughs> Everybody wants to get rid of this guy as fast as they can. <laughs> so if, even if someone lives so long that he finds there's nothing left to do now except take up spiritual life. If he lived his former years chasing the illusion of sense pleasure, he will find it very, very difficult uh, after so many years of that to now fix the mind on Krishna. He becomes known as pretender, Nitya Charya Sauche. Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, the third chapter. Uh, Indriyani Samyaya Yadaste Manasasmana Indriyatnam Dimudha Ma Nitya Chaya Suchiti. Lord Krishna declares that one whose senses are not active in sense gratification, but yet whose mind is absorbed in the thoughts of sense pleasure, he is Nitya Chaya, he's just a pretender. And Dimudha is very, very foolish. Very, very foolish to attempt this, this pretense, this false show of spiritual life. It is like the story of the, uh, the jackal's Chaturmasya. I mentioned this rainy season is called Chaturmas, four months. So uh, traditionally, 
sadhus, saintly persons in India during this four months of monsoon, uh, they do not travel. They stay in one place, one holy place, and they perform austerities. They eat less. They chant more. They study the scriptures. They make great endeavor to purify themselves and make spiritual advancement. So there was a jackal who was crossing what was a shallow river, but became suddenly flooded by the monsoon rains, just as he was trying to get across. So he was cut off in the middle by torrential streams of water and ended up on one island. And all around him there was this rushing current of big swollen bloody river. So there he was. What to do? I'm trapped on this island. And then he thought, well, the sadhus, they take advantage of Chaturmasya by performing austerities and meditating and so on. So maybe I should do the same. So then the jackal sat down in some good way he could approximate as a yoga posture with his jackal body. And he held his neck up straight and half closed his eyes and he began to chant Om. Om. <laughs> and in this way he was starting to feel very good about himself. Yes, this is a good thing to do. Then out of the corner of his eye, he saw a fresh dead body being carried down the stream by the flood waters which is something you'll often see in India <coughs> in rainy season. People get trapped in the floods. Their bodies are washed down big rivers. So he saw his dead body. Oh, <laughs> here it comes. So then he jumped out of his yoga posture and was stretching his neck out as far as he could, extending his jaws, <laughs> trying to snap that body went by, but he couldn't quite make it. Indeed, he almost fell himself into the pull of the current. He was almost swept away. He just managed to scramble back onto the island. And then he looked very forlornly, very sadly, as the body went around the bend of the river. And then he thought, oh, too bad. What a word to do. Huh? Back to Chaturmas. <laughs> so this jackal chaturmas. This is uh, Nitya Chari. This is the life of the pretender. You see? And this is what happens to one who invests all his youthful energy in sense pleasure and then at the end of life thinks, well, let me now prepare myself for death. He becomes just like that jackal. He's only engaged in spiritual life because there's really nothing else for him to do at this time of life. But if by chance there does come the opportunity for sense gratification, immediately he's, his full attention is on that again. Very lamentable position. This is no state of mind to be in uh, when death is coming. Because, as you may have heard, it's a common experience for persons who are in some uh, deadly situation, for instance, uh, people who have fallen from great heights, uh, who were certain as they were falling that now I'm going to die, but somehow or other survived. They very often report that they relive their whole life within a flash. Everything they experienced in life, all the things that they thought they forgot, suddenly flashed before their eyes. Now why is that? Yeah, that's the spool of memory uh, in our subconscious, subconscious mind. Everything that we experience, not only in this life, but in all other lives, that is recorded. So when death comes upon us, our activities in this human life, there is instant replay, you see? Like they do in the sport games. Instant replay. It's 
instantly we play. And why is this? Uh, so this awakens all the emotions. Us, everything that we may have thought because we're in our very old age and our senses are now very weak and our mind is anyway so feeble but can it think of? So we may think that uh, yeah, now we've got, we're all behind all that, you see. All the attractions of youth, that's safely behind us. But suddenly, we have to relive it all. And if the mind is not genuinely fixed on Krishna, then the mind will become again agitated, inflamed. When we see our first love, oh, there she is. Oh, why did my man <laughs> And this is all being observed. The Bhagavatam says that there are uh, witnesses, 13 witnesses, uh, and cosmic witnesses, which judge the karma of the human being as he's leaving his body. And so the witnesses, the stars, the sun, the moon, the directions, and so on, they're all watching. Uh -huh. So that's what you like. I see, all right. That's what you like, that's what you'll get in the next life. So we cannot hide. If we have not actually heightened, raised our consciousness above material sense pleasure, that will all be revealed at the time of death. So in the Yartan Jimudha, Sri Krishna says, one who therefore takes in this human form of life, this very rare, valuable human form of life, one who takes the objects of the senses, the material uh, objects of the senses, to the arta, arta means uh, that which is of value. He considers a sense pleasure to be the valuable thing in his life, worth throwing his life away from. Krishna says, this person is uh, vimudha, very, very foolish. Uh, because this sense gratification, it is not pleasure. It is not pleasure. It is described as madness. Uh, this, uh, what is that? Nunam pramata, guru devi prana, yadindi pritya yaprinu. So, a person is considered crazy. Pramata. Mata means already mad. And when the prefix pra is put in front, just like you might have heard of the great devotee prala. So the root word is hla, like hlavini. Hlavini shakti. Hlada means bliss. And when it is pra, this pra prefix is put in front, prala means uh, abundantly blissful. Is abundantly blissful devotee of Krishna. So when the root word is mata, which means mad, and then the prefix pra is put in front, it means very crazy. So nunam pramata kuruti vikarma, one who engages himself in sinful activities, vikarma, yet prithya uh, hiya prithya hiya prithya for uh, sinful activities, for enjoying the senses. That person is very, very crazy. Nasaramani, yatnamoyam, one who is sane, he'll never do such a thing. Because ashana be yashana be Because the same person knows this body to be what it really is. Is a place of suffering, klesha. Like klesha tried three kinds of suffering. First of all, the body itself generates all sorts of sufferings without any other cause. And just like uh, when we have to sit in this class, whether we're giving the class or giving the class, from time to time we have to move our bodies in different ways, shift the position. Because we become uncomfortable. The body itself 
without any external uh, disturbance is itself disturbed, even if it just sits in one place for too long. And we feel always within the body different aches and pains and twinges and pokes and this and that. All throughout the day we feel these things. The body by itself gets old, gets diseased. So this is one kind of place, one kind of misery. But apart from that, apart from the body itself being a place of misery, there are miseries imposed upon the body by other living entities. This is another kind of place. Whether they be little microbes that invade our body and do things inside, or uh, big ugly hell's angels who punch us in the nose because they don't like the way they look, whatever. And the third kind of plesha, third kind of misery, comes from the natural surroundings. Like, now in Stockholm it's very cold. By the arrangement of nature, this is a plesha. This is a kind of suffering that we have to bear. So this is the condition of the body, material body. It is a place of suffering only. Even in this sense pleasure, someone may say, all right, all that suffering is there, but there's also some sense gratification. Let's not forget about that. But Krishna points out in the Bhagavad Gita that this too, yehi samsparsa bhoga dukha that this contact of the senses with their sense objects, this is also dukha yoni, this is also the cause of suffering. It's like AIDS. Everyone's talking about AIDS. BBC reports that every 15 seconds someone on this planet catches AIDS. And they predict by the end of the century there will be whole nations, whole countries in Africa which will be depleted, which will just collapse, depleted of the human population. The societies won't be able to function anymore because so many people have AIDS and, and will die by that time. So, from where does this age come? Uh, this is certainly dukkha, suffering. Yehi samsparsa jambo comes from bhoga, sense gratification. And that's only one example. For every type of sense pleasure you want to name, one can name a concomitant distress. Well, not just one, many, 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 which are produced by this sense gratification. So, there's just no way out of this simple fact of life that the body is a place of misery. And it is a hallucination. It is indeed, this, the word maya exactly applies to this, this idea that I can enjoy this body. This is maya through and through. The illusion. So one who succumbs to this maya and thinks, let me enjoy this nice body. He's vimuta. He's very, very foolish. He doesn't understand that he's suffering in this life and already from this body. And if he engages in his vikarma, sinful actions, to gratify the senses of his body, then he is creating with every sinful act, he's creating another body. several hours, 
one Saturday night, they can rack up a few hundred future bodies, you see. Four-legged bodies, six-legged bodies, winged bodies, thin bodies, fish bodies, whatever they may be. Simply by sampling these different varieties of sense pleasure. And if you think the human body is miserable, just wait till you get some worm under a rock body, something like that. Of course, these forms of life are also so much in darkness. This is the thing about animal existence, the lower forms of life. They're so much in ignorance that they're not even aware of their suffering. From our point of view as human beings, we look at these lower creatures and we pity them. We feel, you know, I would not like to be in this form of life. And you see these poor insects struggling along the floor. They don't know where they're going. They bump into something and flip over, or over on their back and then their legs are just squirming away. And then some other creature comes up to them swallows them suddenly without warning. So we, we think, what a horrible way to live. But when one is in that body, one is so much in ignorance, one doesn't realize. There's so much, their consciousness is so much tuned into the particular sense pleasures of that body. They, they have no, like in computer talk, RAM, you know, random access. They have no more brain power to understand their horrible situation. Just that, no, there's a breadcrumb. Let me go there. No matter what comes in their way, they're still trying to get that breadcrumb. They just don't understand it. Maybe someone, some person who's just now putting his foot down, right, on their back, they're still struggling to get that breadcrumb. So from the human perspective, we can see how miserable these lower forms of life are. So now we should uh, accept the full consequences <coughs> of this understanding. That if we imitate these lower forms of life, that we are also struggling for the breadcrumb. This is how we spend our human form. It's a fact. I remember once hearing a lecture. <laughs> it was a lecture by some so-called spiritual person in a place in California, Davis, California. There was a spiritual festival a long time ago, back in the 70s. And there was one person who wrote a well-known book called Be Here Now. The cover of the book was an ice cream cone in the sky. This was his conception of spirituality. So, <laughs> he gave a lecture. So, and and he, he was the, he was the, you know, he was the, uh, the, the headliner of this whole festival. He was the most famous spiritual person, so-called. So everyone was, everyone came from everywhere to sit down and hear his lecture with rapt attention. And uh, so I was, I, I was a devotee man. Uh, and I was, we had a, a booth set up for selling Prabhupada's books and incense and things. So I could hear the lecture with the loudspeakers. And uh, all he lectured about was eating pizza. <laughs> subject of his lecture. How to eat pizza <laughs> in higher consciousness. <laughs> he said, don't feel guilty that you have a desire to eat a pizza. Go on eating the pizza. Just as you with every bite, you should, uh, what did he say, you should reflect with cosmic sympathy upon your predicament 
But here, here you are in this world eating this pizza. In other words, there's some kind of really weird concept that at the same time you're down here on Earth eating pizza, you're somehow one with the universe. You should think of yourself in that way as being the cosmic being who can see yourself eating the pizza and is feeling sorry for you. Your higher self is looking at you, shaking his head and thinking, what a stupid this life away. Just to again take an endless series, lower forms, before one again has the opportunity to come up to the human station where there is the possibility of becoming liberated from this cycle of birth and death. So Srila Prabhupada, to conclude here, Srila Prabhupada says in the third word that Uh, the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, 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 is the best process for successfully changing one's state of being at the end of one's life. So this chanting of Hare Krishna should be practiced throughout your life. This is the point. Don't think that you can uh, not chant Hare Krishna throughout the life and then at the end the last minute, suddenly, you remember to chant. No, we have to practice. We have to cultivate this consciousness, this Krishna consciousness. So this is very simple and sublime. So, chanting Mahai Krishna, very simple, and yet it is the most powerful sadhana, the most powerful discipline of bhakti yoga. themselves, but they're full of lust, 
So they just like to watch others. More than and they also like to watch other people have this sex. Because they have subtle bodies, they can look at it from any angle. <laughs> vision. Because their bodies are not gross. So this is the business of ghosts. So our culture is becoming pornographic. So that means people are going to become ghosts. And that's all. In the Guru de Purana, there are many uh, uh, indications of how one becomes a ghost. Uh, drunkards become ghosts. Persons who live in filth, who never bathe, who never chant Vedic mantras. You know, even persons who uh, destroy the environment. The penalty for that is also to become a ghost. And many other indications. So we see that all these activities, besides the pornography, are very, very prominent, especially this pornography, which is ghostly. simply for the sake of that person. That's how we understand love. When you love another person, it doesn't mean you love their bank balance. It doesn't mean that you love the possessions around them, and that's why you're showing interest. That's something else. But you love that person for that person. So in the material world, there is actually know such love. There's only lust. Because we're not even loving the person. We're loving that which is around the person, the body. And why do we love that body? Because the body gives our body a sense of pleasure. So this is not love. This is lust. But loving Krishna, to love Krishna, means that the soul uh, is freed from the bodily concept. The senses of the soul, the spiritual senses of the soul are awakened and they perceive the transcendental beauty of Krishna and they are drawn in love to serve Krishna's transcendental without any motivation, without any uh, plan to uh, attain even liberation. So not to speak of, of some material benefit from our service. The devotee does not even desire liberation. He's not calculating. You see, this is love. No calculation. He's not thinking that, well, if I serve Krishna, then I'll be sure to be delivered in this lifetime. No, there's no calculation. 
said, Krishna is so nice. Krishna is so beautiful. Krishna is so wonderful. Let me serve him. There's no other purpose to these senses I have than to simply serve Krishna. Don't want to talk about this too much. <laughs> <laughs> 